Um, hi. So um, I was asked to do a, a talk on, on the topic of flow, so I looked it up in the dictionary. Um, and so uh, flow in the dictionary, it says, is uh, uh, the ability to deform under stress uh, without cracking or rupturing, or a continuous transfer of energy, which I quite liked. Um, so for me, flow is pretty much what it's all about, you know, c creativity, design, changing the world, uh, the, the meaning of life, everything. It's all about, about flow, about building flow, about tapping into flow, finding flow, you know, um, constantly moving at the same time, maintaining a sense of direction, you know, or, or um, focusing and at the same time being able to shift gears or change spots when needed. So um, my name is, uh, is Jan and I'm uh, an activist. And that statement doesn't get that much cheers most of the time, so I, I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> and and to be and to be to be fair, I only recently found out that I'm an activist. So I recently discovered that it took me about ten years to realize. Um, but but I'm an activist. Um, basically, activism. When I think activism, um, most of the times I think of of protest. You know, marching the streets with that strange vibe that lies somewhere in between being really angry and being at a festival, right? And ideally, you spice it up with some, with some uh, tweetable slogans or some, you know, nice cardboard signs or something like that. And um, yeah, so so when I think activism, I think of people chaining themselves to the gates of a production or a nuclear power plant. You know, I think about people taking on a Japanese whaler with a small rubber boat, stuff like that. I think about revolution. And and I don't revolt. You know, I, I design companies. I write reports and I teach and I guide uh, organizations, stuff like that. Um, so I totally understand why we're angry, though. I mean, we are pretty much overstepping every planetary boundary there is. Our resources are becoming more scarce every day. Social inequality is on the rise. Biodiversity is falling. Um, educational and political systems are really urgently uh, up to a, a structural redesign. Um, and if we look at, at extremism and populism, they're sort of feeding off each other hatred and taking over the entire public debate. I mean, I understand why we're angry, but I just think that these challenges are far too important to be reduced to sort of a, this, this continuous stream of temporary outrage that activism is reduced to these days. You know, we get really upset or really angry about something, and then we start shouting about it preferably on social media, because that's more anonymous and you don't have to leave your chair and you don't have to really do something. And then afterwards, we sort of move on to the next thing to be angry about. You know, a, a continuous stream of, of being upset with the state of the world right now without having a bigger concept or an idea on what it could be or should be apart from, from not this. But, uh, but I totally understand why we're angry, but I, I just don't feel that this kind of old-school activism marching the streets is really helpful. Um, so when I was a kid, um, or at least when I was younger, and when I wasn't yet um, you know, sleep deprived by raising kids and running a company and committing to insane deadlines and all that, um, I, I love to do judo. Um, and now if you ask someone who doesn't know what judo is about, what judo is about, they will probably say something about throwing someone else to the floor. You know, and, and if they watch the Olympics, they might even know it's called scoring an ippon. Uh, this this part. So, while watching an, uh, an Ushimata unfold is a great thing to see, but this is not the most interesting part of judo. Because the only thing going on in the mind of that guy right now is, oh shit. And it's not, oh shit, because he's going to fall. Falling is easy, it's the first thing you learn in judo. But he's thinking, oh shit, because he just realized what his opponent realized about half a, min a, half a second ago. His opponent realized that he misstepped. You know, he took his balance of his left foot just a little too long, or he went into a turn just a little too far. He placed his center point slightly off base. Whatever it was that he did, the only thing he can try to do now is try to not fall flat on his back, which, in the trajectory he's in right now, is pretty impossible. I told you. Um, so, but but this is not the most interesting part of judo. The throwing is not the most important part. The most important part is the building up to a throw. And it all starts with a good kumikata. Kumikata is when you try to get a, a grab of your opponent. You, know, you try to feel where they are, where they are going. Ideally, you try to 
to, to steer their movements a bit, but in the end it basically comes to trying to predict what's going to happen because you feel them. You know, it's, um, it's that part of judo, if it all works out a bit. Well, it usually goes smoother than that. Um, but the idea is that you, you, know, you, you, you get a hold of each other and you try to see where it goes. And a good kumikata is a great advantage, but it doesn't guarantee a victory. The most important part, the most, the most crucial part of judo is understanding the concept of flow. It's understanding that if someone pushes you, you don't push back, but you take their arm, you extend the movement, you bring them off balance, and then you sweep them off their feet. That's the basic idea of judo, is don't fight against stuff, just go with it and knock them off their feet afterwards. And while, so I had to stop doing judo uh, a while ago because of I have bad knees and I have a very unpredictable calendar, and it's sort of combined into not doing judo anymore. Um, but the concept of flow is still very relevant today, and I, I still use it on a daily basis. For example, I'm a, a huge nerd, and I'm also a father, and that sort of combined into telling my kids stories about science from a really early age on. And I can tell you it's a fascinating thing to talk about space-time and gravity using Duplos to a two and a four-year-old. It's real fun. Um, but sort of I was, I was doing that, sort of minding my own business and, and teaching my kids uh, nerd stuff. Um, and I got a question from TEDx Antwerp to give a talk. And um, I really hate TED Talks that are sort of hidden pitches on, on what it is you're doing. So I thought I will not talk about my work. I will not talk about some, some project I did. Maybe I should just talk about why I tell my kids stories about science. So, so I did. And then afterwards, people came up and asked me, um, do you write these things down somewhere so I can tell them to my kids? And I didn't. And so the first reflex you have then is to sort of defend why you do or don't do stuff. But I thought instead of that, maybe just, you know, flow. I just go with it. And so I explored the idea, maybe I could write them down. So I hired a, an illustrator. We created a first version of a, a child book. I sent it to about a dozen of publishers. I got rejected about a zillion times. Um, and so the good thing then is you can just cancel it. But I thought, no, maybe just I should just call these publishers and ask them what they are missing or why it doesn't work. You know, the concept of flow, instead of pushing back, just take it in and see where it takes you. So um, I got their feedback. I hired another illustrator who made a version two. And now um, these children books are being put into a child book series. Um, there's number three is coming along. We've got at least six coming up. And they're being translated in Dutch, in Danish, and in English, which is great because I get to call myself an international author. And I have to spend about two days working on a book. Uh, which is basically just reading science reports and research and translating it to a story my kids would like, which is something I was doing before already, so that's great for me. Um, so the concept of flow is, is, is a really interesting thing to just sort of build in in your daily habits, in, in, in your daily practice. And when working on sustainability, which incidentally is a, is a topic I'm working on, um, flow is very interesting because in, in fields like sustainability, it's it's a lot of fighting, you know? It's a lot of um, pushing boundaries, finding allies, making plans, throwing these plans away again, admitting that you were wrong, getting thrown to the floor, getting up again, getting thrown to the floor again. I mean, this entire cycle, I see it all around me, people working in, this, in these fields. And I mean, this, this sort of getting up against each other and, and fighting out who owns the truest truth, you know? And it's, it's this, this, this standoff between ideologies, it's extremely, um, I mean, it's extremely tiring. And it's also, I mean, you can pretty much tell beforehand what's going to happen. It's, it's, it's tiring and it's, it's, it's pretty dumb. Um, so I thought maybe I should not be part of that side of changing the world. You know, there's not much that you can grow in a place where everything gets cut down before it's got time to develop. So I thought maybe um, we should find something else because we're always talking about change and how change has to be inclusive and all that, but I mean, this is not what inclusive change looks like to me. This is not what it is. So I thought maybe I should find another way, you know, a better way to change stuff, an easier way also, but also something that actually changes stuff, you know, with a broad support base. So I think if you, if you design, and especially if you design in, in, in complexity like sustainability or social innovation, the first thing you should realize is there is no such thing as designing solutions. You know, there are no final answers here. So it really doesn't matter what your final product is or what your 
design was or what the ipon was that you scored. That it doesn't really matter. What's important is the setting up to a throw, how you approach the system, that kind of stuff. And so design, I think, is much more about um, observing and intervening when and wherever possible instead of trying to guide stuff around. I mean, creativity and design is much more about gardening or, or tending than it is about managing or fighting stuff. Um, there's this, this great quote that we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. And, and that's something I really believe in, is that um, we, everybody, not just designers, everybody sees the world through how they experience it. And we experience it through our interpretation of reality, you know, through the, the products that we use, through the tools and the movies uh, that, we, that we watch, through the books that we read, through the people that we talk to, all that kind of stuff. We interpret reality and that's how we look at it. So that means that as a designer, you can actively tap into that. Um, and I think when, when designing for sustainability, it is always important to see how can we as designers make people see at things differently. And there's two things I learned when working on sustainability, uh, on the design point of view. There's two big learning lessons. Number one is design is a superpower. We don't look at it often enough like that. Design is a superpower because we are actively being designed by the things that we have designed. Because the way we look at stuff, the way we interact with stuff is always dependent on the things we have around us, be it the products or the graphic design or the way you have to enter a building. All that stuff dictates how we look at stuff, how we interpret stuff, how we experience things. So your job as a designer is not just to create better products. Your job as a designer is to create better experiences that help in making this society a better place. And that's a really interesting superpower you have as a designer because basically what you're doing is you have the power to change the way that people think. You have the power to change the way that people look at stuff through the tools that they use. And so I think that's a, a superpower that we should harness and we should try to, to, to improve on is how can we, as designers, change the software of people? How can we change their mindsets? And number two, I think is, is vitally important, is, is the idea of flow. I mean, don't set up to, to fight. Don't set up to push back just for the sake of, of pushing back. Don't debate with people just to win, you know, flow. Um, if, if, if they go low, don't pick the moral high ground, just go with them. Find out how they got there in the first place and, and learn and, and try to get them out of there. You know, if they push you, extend the movement, bring them off balance, show them where it might lead them, but don't throw. You know, just teach and learn while you're at it because you're probably also pretty narrow in your own mindset. Um, I think that this, this concept of flow is vitally important. I mean, there is absolutely no victory in watching the world fall apart and screaming, I told you, while doing so. So, I think in order to actually make structural changes in the world, you have to be part of the structure. I mean, there is no changing the system if you don't partake in it. And, and I totally understand this idea of, of, of this feeling of, of not feeling to compromise or, or to, to, to uh, comply with whatever it is that you're in at this point. And I totally get the feeling of, of fuck this shit, I'm off to Disneyland. You know, I'm off to this place where everything and everyone's happy, where people listen, where people actually care about stuff. But, I mean, facts and, 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 and absolute truth don't change the public debate. I mean, if we really looked at facts as if there were facts, there would be no debate on whether or not climate is changing. There would be no debate on whether or not gun reform is a good idea. There would be no debate on whether or not it's ethical to ignore the hundreds of homeless refugees sleeping in stations every night in Europe. There would be no debate about it. But facts don't change our societal system. Our interpretation of reality does. What we do with the facts does. The products we make, the systems we make, the stories we tell, the actions we create. That's the stuff that changes the world. So, I think these, these, these kind of places where you can go to where everybody agrees, they're great to 
rejuvenate, you know, to, to recharge your batteries, to find new ideas. And we often pretend that these are the places where structural change comes from, but it isn't. You can't change the system by not taking part of it. You have to be in there. And it, I mean, the whole idea of innovation, the whole idea of society is the fact that we can live together apart from the fact that we don't agree on stuff. That's what society makes society. It's not that we all agree on the same thing. It's that we don't agree on stuff and we think that's okay. So I think the most important part with, with activism and maybe something that we forgot as activists is activism is about actions. It's not about isms. It doesn't really matter if we all think the same. It's about how can we make change go further. So the way I look at it or the way I, I try to use it is I see activism as a sort of a, a compass and I use my entrepreneurship skills as a map to actually make stuff happen and then use design as the default mindset to actually go there. And, and I think we don't need more star designers and we don't need more ego entrepreneurs and we don't need more angry citizens. We need more change. Thank you. <laughs>